Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, an Oklahoma rancher and farmer. Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for over 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon. And uh, even though Oklahoma has been hot, 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 hasn't it? But uh, we're glad you're here, and uh, we just trust that uh, the Lord will bless our time together this afternoon. For those of you out on television, of course, we always like to welcome you right into our class, and we appreciate when you write and say, I just feel like I'm sitting in the back row. And uh, I guess that's exactly what we're trying to put across. We want you to be a part of this as a study. And we always emphasize we're, we're not on any one denominational line. We do not attack others. We're just simply going to teach the Word. And uh, you may not always agree with me. You know, I, I expect that, and we don't have to, except on some of the basic fundamentals, of course. There is no room for argument. But there are places where we can have disagreement without being disagreeable. But uh, whatever, if we can just succeed in getting folk to get back into a study of the Word on their own and not just sit and let other people throw stuff at you and uh, you not knowing whether it's right or wrong. You know, I always like to give the example. Uh, how true it is, I don't know, but I once read one time that when uh, young folks go in and begin their work with the U.S. Treasury Department in view of going against counterfeit money, for the first six months of their employment, they do nothing but study legitimate American bills. Well, the idea is that if you know what the legitimate looks like, a counterfeit will just pop right up in front of you. Well, now I use that as the same way with the Word of God. If folk would just know what the Bible says and know it forwards and backwards, then when this counterfeit stuff comes along, you'll see it right away. And uh, so that's really my main purpose. All right, I guess I guess always have to let the folks know we have new listeners every day that we do have all the past programs are available on video, audio, and the little printed page as they'll usually show it on the screen. But uh, anyway, uh, those things are available. And if you're interested, there they are. If you're interested in any of this material, which is just simply word for word from the programs, you uh, call us or write to us and we'll get them to you. Okay. Back to the book, Galatians chapter 4, and we stopped in our last program in verse 14, and so we'll just move right on up to verse 15, remembering always that the book of Galatians is Paul proving that we're not under the law, we're under grace, and oh, it's so appropriate even for today, and so we're really going to hit it today, that we're not under law, we're under grace. Verse 15, where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Now, what was the man saying? That there was such a bond of affection between these pagan Galatians who had come under Paul's gospel and the transforming power of it, and they just... They loved the man in spite of his physical inadequacies, and he had them. And he said it was in such a degree, and that's why I feel he had an eye problem, they would have given their healthy eyes to replace his sickly ones because they had such a love for him. And as he says to the Thessalonians, now here we go again, honey, we start in Galatians, turn over to Thess First Thessalonians. And uh, I think this is typical of all of Paul's converts, with the exception, of course, of some of the Jewish believers. But whenever he went into a pagan community, remember, it was all steeped in idolatry. But when they heard his gospel message, here is the result. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. And this says it better than I ever could. Y'all with me? For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. In other words, when he came into this strange, pagan, Greek city of Thessalonica, 
And he said, What entering in we had unto you, and how you turned from idols to the living God. Doesn't that say it all? He came into this strange city with no fanfare, no trumpeting introductions, and he merely began confronting people with the gospel of the grace of God, how that Christ had died for their sin. And they believed it. And they turned, the scripture says, they turned from their idols to the true and living God. All right, now then back to Galatians. It was the same way. They had entered into such a joy of their salvation, realizing that it was all of grace. And then, as happens all the time today, you know, I see it over and over. Whenever we have a new believer who comes under the, the power of the gospel and they've come away from all of this other stuff and they enter into a salvation by grace, what happens? Oh, they start getting bombarded with all of the pressure to come back. I had a phone call again just this morning where the poor man was just beside himself because he had come out of this false teaching. I won't name the, the, the particular organization, but he says, I come out of it and I've seen the truth of the word as you teach it, but oh, he said, the pressure, the pressure, constant, to come back to where he had been before. And listen, this, this is not new. The Galatians were under the same thing, see? And Paul says, here you were in such a state of blessedness, you had such a love for me, you would have plucked out your own eyes to be replacement for me. And now then, he says, verse 16, and my therefore become your enemy simply because I'm continuing, now I'm paraphrasing it for emphasis, because I'm continuing to give you the truth. But should I show you what the truth did? Turn again. Come on to the right to Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter 1. Second Timothy, chapter 1. Now listen, if you think you get discouraged sometimes and, and, and you wonder why you or I or anybody else cannot have the results that we'd like to have, listen, it's always been that way. That's why I don't get discouraged. My land, when you come to the flood out of, I think, four or five billion people on the world, how many? Eight. Eight out of four or five billion. You get to Jesus at the end of his three years of earthly ministry, at least in the area of Jerusalem. How many? 120. 120. And that's next to nothing. And all the way up through Scripture, it's ever been that way. And so here again, look what happened to these converts that Paul had brought out of paganism. Because you want to remember, Galatia was in Asia Minor. Always remember geography when you, when you read Scripture because geography and history, it all fits together with the overall working of the Holy Spirit. All right, now look what happened in 2 Timothy then, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. That good thing, Paul writes to Timothy, which was committed unto thee, in other words, the gospel, keep, uh, yeah, keep by the Holy Spirit which dwelleth unto, in us. Now, verse 15 is the one I wanted. This thou knowest. In other words, it wasn't just Paul's idea. Even Timothy and Titus and his other helpers realized it. This thou knowest that all they who are in Asia, which would include Galatia, remember, be turned away from me. In other words, as I was reflecting on this driving up again this morning, come back to Galatians 4. In other words, how much effect did the letter to the Galatians really have in the long term? Almost none. Oh, it's good for us. Don't get me wrong. It's part of the Word of God. But so far as its impact on these Galatian congregations, it evidently fell on pretty much deaf ears because several years later when he writes to Timothy, he has by inspiration say they've all turned against him. Well, you know what I think they did? They all fell under legalism, and consequently none of those churches survived. They're in the one of those cities left today. They've all fallen into the dust of history, and all because they refused to stay with Paul's simple gospel of grace. Sad, isn't it? 
Well, listen, the world hasn't changed a bit. It's still the same way today. Oh, they just almost ridicule this concept of faith plus nothing. Where are you coming from? Well, I'll tell you where I'm coming from, from the book, see? All right, back to Galatians chapter 4. So verse 16 again, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You know, usually people don't like the truth, do they? Then verse 17, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. All right, now in order to explain that, let's let the scripture explain it. Come back to chapter 1. See, a lot of these verses, they're kind of hard to comprehend. We think, well, what is the apostle driving at? Well, you see what he's driving at? They were beginning to believe these Judaizers who were coming in and demanding circumcision and law-keeping as over against Paul's pure gospel of grace. And what does he call it? Chapter 1 now, verse 6, I marvel you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. And that's what brought them out of their idolatry was Paul's gospel of grace. But what were they slipping into? The influence of another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another. In other words, it's not something just totally different. But what was it? A perversion. A perversion. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And although the perverters finally succeeded, evidently, or Paul wouldn't have had to write that to Timothy, see? But he did write it. All that are in Asia, including Galatia, have turned against me. And so now, if you'll come back to Galatians chapter 4, we're going to see how the apostle Paul is going to miraculously use the scriptures to teach us a lesson. If the Galatians didn't catch it, let's hope that we do. Verse 18, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. In other words, when he was in their presence and he, his, his actual physical presence was there, then evidently they, they could uh, kind of hold everything together. But as soon as he'd be gone, then in would come the false teachers, you know, like ravening wolves, and they would just simply tear these little congregations apart. All right, now verse 19. Here is one of my favorite portions of Scripture. And I've always told my class here in Oklahoma, if you're ever put on the spot to have a devotional for your Sunday school or your women's group or men's group or whatever, boy, here's one of the best ones you can use. Oh, this is a dandy. And it's so easy to present. My little children, verse 19 of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. In other words, what's he saying? Just like the mother's birth pangs of bringing forth that beautiful, innocent baby, Paul felt to these pagans who also had been transformed and had made a regular birthing process into the eternal things as a result of his gospel. And he was thrilled by it, see? But oh, now they're in trouble. They're listening to false teachers. And he says, I desire, verse 20, I desire to be present with you now and to change, or I hope I'm not taking away the thought. But he really says, I'd like to raise my voice. In other words, what? Get your attention. I'm just going to have to literally raise my voice so that you hear what I'm saying. For I stand in doubt of you. Why? because they were falling for this stuff, see? Now verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, you who desire to want to do something in addition to the gospel, do you not hear the law? For it is written. Now I've told you over and over, whenever you see Paul use that term, what's he going to tell you? What's he, where's he going to take you? Back to the Old Testament. And so we're going to go back there in just a moment. For it is written in the Old Testament that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. 
Now, of course, most of you know what he's talking about, but there may be some out there in television that have never heard this before, so for their benefit, we're going to go over it again. And that takes us back, of course, to Genesis. All the way back to Genesis, and I think I want to go, I was going to say first 21, but I want to go further. Back to 16. Now, this is within a chapter or two of the Abrahamic covenant, but of course years have been rolling by chronologically. And so Abram, as we still know him here, Abram has already been waiting 36 years for the promise of Genesis 12 to be fulfilled. And that is that he would have a son, and out of that son would come a special race or nation of people. All right? Now then, 36 years of waiting. Now, don't, don't get too impatient with the old fella. I think we'd all felt the same way, that God had forgotten never giving him the promise. That's a long time. I don't care what period of time in human history, 36 years is a long time, and no child. Sarai has no signs whatsoever of ever being able to have a child. And so finally, she's the one that gives up first, really, and so chapter 16, verse 1, now I'm not going to finish this in this half hour, so those of you on television, you wait, it'll come in the next half hour and maybe the next one, but we're going to hold all this together and we're not going to rush it. All right, so Sarai said unto Abram, now I'm pronouncing it the way it should be pronounced because she will not become Sarah and he will not become Abraham until some time later. And so Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Now, whenever we teach this back in Genesis, I always make the point, who is totally lacking in this conversation? Well, God is. See, God hasn't said a word yet. All God has said... I'm going to make out of you, and of course, Sarah was implied, I'm going to make out of you a nation of people, which had to start with a son. But here you see, God hasn't said a word. And that's why when we get back to Galatians, this whole scenario of Hagar and Ishmael is called after the flesh. This is after the flesh. Isaac is going to be the son of the promise of God. See the difference? God isn't involved here. Now, I know sovereignly he is. I know that the sovereign God had to be somehow or other controlling the flow of all these events. But nevertheless, so far as the text is concerned, God has had nothing to say about having a child by the slave woman. So, of the flesh. Don't forget that. And so Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar and made the Egyptian. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife so that she could have a child by him. And, of course, she does. Verse 4. And then, verse 5. Now, again, I guess we have to understand the female of the species and we have to understand the customs of the day. And according to the laws of Hammurabi, the old Babylonian seer, why if a, a wife could not have a child physically, then it was perfectly moral and upright in their culture to have a child then by a servant or a slave girl, and that's what they practiced here. See, they, they were not going contrary to their morality of their day, but on the other hand, God has not told them to do it this way, but they did it in the energy of the flesh, and now, of course, the slave girl is with child. And now look what happens. Verse 5. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was what? Despised. Now, like I say, that, that probably enters in a little bit to the makeup of our female of the species, our, our women. But whatever. All of a sudden now, Hagar was literally making a fool out of Sarai, her mistress, simply because she was able to bear a child and she wasn't. And it just infuriated poor Sarai. And she says, now the Lord judge between me and thee. 
But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, the maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. Bingo! What happened? Sarai kicks her out. Let, let's just put it in plain English. Sarai kicks her out. She says, Out of my house. I'll have nothing more to do with you. All right? And so she dealt hardly with her. And so Hagar fled from her face. Because after all, Sarai was the boss, I guess we'd say. She was the, the mistress. And so Hagar, the Egyptian slave girl, fled. Now remember, she hasn't had her child yet. All right, now then, the angel of the Lord, verse 7. And I've explained that often enough in this class. The angel of the Lord is Christ, or the God the Son in His Old Testament appearance. And so the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, out in the way to Shur, out in the desert. And uh, verse 9, I'll, I'll skip verse 8 just for sake of time. In verse 9, the angel of the Lord, or the, the Christ, God the Son, said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hand. Now that was a command from God. Go back to Sarai and Abram. No ifs, ands, buts about it. And... Uh, the angel of the Lord, verse 10, said unto her, And I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that is, coming out of Ishmael, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And so the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. All right, so she goes back to the home or the tent of Abram and Sarai, and I've explained it out to our... Uh, Oklahoma classes. Iris and I had the privilege many, many years ago of visiting a Arab sheikh, uh, hope I'm pronouncing that right, out in the desert of the Negev, and I suppose they were Bedouins, and it was a rather interesting situation. Uh, he served us in what he called his tent, and it really wasn't much there, but out behind were four smaller tents, just one, two, three, four. And uh, while he was making good old Arab coffee for us, which was more like syrup than coffee, but while he was fixing coffee for us and we were sitting there on the ground, all of a sudden here comes 24 of the prettiest little kids you could ever imagine, all pretty much the same size. And they just about smothered Iris, you know, tried to get the rings off her fingers and just looking at her hair and everything, you know, and she was just having a ball. But all of a sudden, the old fella just made one bark like a dog, and those kids were gone. Well, after we'd had our coffee and everything, and we were able to roam around a little bit, we saw those four tents out behind his tent, and we found out that those were his four wives. So if you divide 24 by 4, they all had an average, at least, of about six kids. But it just immediately set the setting for this here. Now, when we say, speak of Hagar coming back and dwelling with Abram, they weren't in the same tent. These women had each their own tent out behind, see? And that's what is evident then as you come a little later when the Lord comes and says that they're going to have a child and then Sarah was standing in her tent door as the Lord was dealing with her. You know the account. Well, just picture that in your mind, see, that out behind the main dwelling tent were the tents of these other wives. All right, now then, as you come, like I said, we're not only try to finish this in a half an hour, we're just going to make this a uh, continuation that will just go into the next program. Now as you come on over to chapter, oh, let's see, 21. Genesis 21. Ishmael is now 13, going on 14. Typical teenager. And uh, chapter 21, and the Lord, verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, and she conceived. Now remember, she's 90, Abraham's 100. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. All right, now do you see the difference? This child is the result of whose promises? Well, God's promises. 
God has said you're going to have a son, and you're going to call his name Isaac, which, of course, interpreted meant laughter. And so now we find that the promised child is finally making his appearance. The child of the flesh is still with him. He's still there because that's where God told Hagar to go. But now you see it's coming to a head. All right, let's read on. We got a moment or two left. And so Abraham, verse 3, called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded. Verse 5, And Abram was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And that's why the word Isaac also meant laughter. And she said, Who would have said unto Abram that Sarah should be giving nurse to children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abram made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Now, I always make a point that chronologically now, Isaac has to be five years old when he's weaned, which, of course, puts uh, uh, Ishmael up to about 18 or 19. He's not a little child anymore. He, he's a, at the end of his teen years. All right, now we've only got a minute left, and I'm not going to go any further because uh, I don't want to lose the context as we move on. But again, for just this last minute, let's rehearse. Here we have God promising for 36 years that Abraham and Sarah will have a son, and nothing happens. Then finally, after 36 years, they take matters into their own hands, and they have a child by virtue of the slave girl, the Egyptian, Hagar. And Sarah is so upset with her reaction to it that she sends her away, probably in almost a rage. And yet while she's out in the desert, the Lord appears to Hagar and says, you go back to Sarah's tent. Now I, I'm impressing that. I want you to see that God sent her back. And I want you at the same time be asking the question, why, when, it's going to be the same thing all over again. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma. 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported and your gift is appreciated. Thank you and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.